Assalamu alaikum. Good day, everyone. I'd like to review our discussion about open economy. Most explanations are given based on uh, your questions you have posed. We know from the MenQ textbook, the chapter covers the followings. Okay, let's start with the first one, the basic definitions. To answer the first question, I would like to show you this uh, familiar equation. Export minus import equals to net export. The emphasis is on goods and services. Export and import are about purchase of goods and services in an open economy. That is why it is measured in GDP. How about capital inflow, capital flow? It is about flow of funds to finance investment, the I. Purchase of foreign assets are capital outflow, whereas purchase of domestic assets are capital inflow. The difference, if positive, is called net capital outflow, meaning that more capital outflow than inflow. If negative, it is called net capital inflow, since capital inflow is now more than capital outflow. Capital flow is just a flow of funds to finance investment or the purchase of capital goods, as I said. No direct purchase of goods or services in the economy. Therefore, they are not included in the GDP. I show you again this. To easily remember outflows and inflow of the capital, the keywords are of course out and into. When the funds are flowing out of the economy, we have capital outflow. On contrary, when the funds are flowing in, we have capital inflow. So, if there are more foreign assets purchased as asked in question 4, we're going to get the assets and in returns, we flow funds out of the economy. What is it? Clear, it is a capital outflow. The increase will add to the net capital outflow. Next, we notice from the previous slide that investment is different to capital flow. Capital flow is the fund to finance I, the physical investment, not the investment itself. Then, what kind of investment is financed using the flow of capital funds? If the funds are allocated directly to buy capital goods, the investment is called foreign direct investment. For instance, firms may build new factory, open new branch, new office, or new outlet abroad. And in return, the fund will then go to the destination country. On the other hand, capital funds may flow in or out of a country, but the use of funds is not directed by the funders. This is what we call as portfolio investment. Funders, in this case, just buy companies or country securities, but the investment or the purchase of capital goods are made by the companies or countries. How about questions number six? What do you think? We will soon talk the identity equation stating that net export is always equal to net capital outflow. But we will see also that capital outflow has no one-to-one -one correlation with country's import. Here is the identity equation. Why is it equal and always equal? The illustration here may let you know why. Suppose you sell tens of t-shirts online to the US citizens in US dollar. Sales of the t-shirts give you $400. How the transaction will be recorded in our country's trade balance? Yes, it will be recorded as an increase in export by $400. The question then is, what will you do with the money? Here, you hold foreign currency. The first possibility is you keep the dollar. Since the dollar is a foreign currency, hence a foreign asset, the holding of dollar is like borrowing funds to U.S. country or U.S. government. Therefore, the funds are flowing out of a country, the capital outflow. 
and at the end, net export increase is accompanied with the increase in net capital outflow. So it is evident, it is evident that net exports is equal to net capital outflow. The second possibility is you may use the dollar to buy US company security, say Apple stock. It is clearly a purchase of foreign assets, a capital outflow. Then, just like the first case, next export increase is accompanied with the increase in net capital outflow. Net export again is equal to net capital outflow. The third possibility is you may use the dollar to buy US companies products such as Xbox online. It has nothing to do with the net capital outflow. Here, import increases, and then export and import will cancel out each other. Leave the net export constant and no change in net capital outflow either. At the end, net export is again evident equals to net capital outflow. Now we have these questions. Remember, Market for loanable funds. In an open economy, we include net export in our calculation of GDP. That is why our equilibrium is no longer saving equals investment. It is saving equals to investment plus net export. And then, since lastly we have the identity net export equals to net capital outflow, saving is now expressed as summation of investment and net capital outflow. If I move the net capital outflow to the right, the equation will look like, will look like this. Saving minus net capital outflow equals to investment. Meaning that to finance domestic investment or I, investors may use domestic fund that is as domestic saving or use foreign funds. When they use foreign funds, funds are flowing into our economy. There is capital inflow. The negative sign of the uh, net capital outflow indicates the opposites of net capital outflow, the net capital inflow. This situation occurs when saving is less than investment or domestic funds are not enough to finance investment. What if saving is bigger than the investment. Well, we now have excess funds in our economy. The funds that are not absorbed domestically will go abroad. People buy more foreign assets, resulting in more capital outflow. Now, how to answer the first questions. When real interest rate increases, what's going to happen? Look at the equation again. Interest rate is an incentive to save. It attracts both domestic savers as and foreign saver, which results in more capital inflow. So higher interest rate will increase saving and capital inflow. More capital inflow means less net capital outflow. On the other hand, for investors, interest rate is cost of borrowing. It is a disincentive to invest. So higher interest rate means higher cost of borrowing, reducing level of investment. Does NCO only measure the purchase of assets by business or also that or, or also that by consumer or individuals? Of course no. Net capital outflow will change no matter who purchased the assets. Answering the third questions it's just a matter of adjusting the national income equation. In an open economy, national income is expressed by this equation. Moving the spending CIG to the left, the equations become when NX is positive, the left side equation is positive. Therefore, Y is bigger than spending. We may rearrange this inequality so that we have this. What is this? Right, the left side is saving. So when Y is bigger than the spending, 
saving will be bigger than investment. Okay, now let's talk about the price in an open trade, the exchange rate. We have these two kinds of exchange rate. What's the difference? From the definition here, it should be clear that nominal exchange rate is a relative price of two currencies, while real exchange rate is a relative price of traded goods and services. Real exchange rate is calculated as follow. Suppose we have this information. US is the domestic economy in this example. We have prices of Big Mac in two countries as well as the nominal exchange rate. Real exchange rate is formulated as nominal exchange rate times domestic price per foreign price. From given information, then we're going to have this real exchange rate. The resulting number shows the relative price of Big Mac in US and Indonesia. It is more expensive in US. To answer question 2 and 3, I may inform you this. Both nominal and real exchange rate are determined in the market. They are, there are demand, they are demand for and supply of currency. Real exchange rate is the price of real variable. So yes, nominal exchange rate, price and uh, domestic price and foreign price are used in RER or real exchange rate calculation. But they are not the factors affecting real exchange rate. As it would be revealed in chapter 32, real exchange rate value depends on change in real variables like net export and the availability of currency to be exchanged in the form of capital flow. When net export and net capital outflow remains the same, change in P per P start, uh, P, uh, change in P and P start ratio usually is cancelled out by the change in nominal exchange rate since they move together, thus leaving real exchange rate unaffected. Will net export and net capital outflow affect nominal exchange rate? Yes, they will. But in the long run, nominal exchange rate movement is more reflecting the movement of domestic and foreign prices as suggested by the purchasing power parity theory. So the answer for question 3 is clear. The answer is yes, domestic price does affect nominal exchange rate. And especially in the long run, it becomes even clearer. Lastly, how about the impact of nominal exchange rate to GDP? We know that openness to trade gives us new component in GDP, namely the net export. The net export, however, is affected by real exchange rate the relative price of goods and services, not merely E or nominal exchange rate. Change in nominal exchange rate, as explained earlier, may not affect real exchange rate if the change just results from change in P per P start that's nothing to do with the international trade. Answer to question 5 was just the same with my last explanation. Higher real exchange rate will affect the relative price of tradable goods and services. Exported goods are now more expensive, while imported goods are now cheaper. So there will be less export and higher import, resulting in lower net export. As for question 6, first we have to understand that real exchange rate is simply a measurement used to analyze or make decision in an open economy, similar to other measures like inflation or GDP. We use data to measure it. Overstatement or understatement, of course, can occur. Why? Because the data we use may be less accurate or imperfect, which most likely they are. Our last discussion is about this concept, purchasing power parity or PPP. Parity means equality, so with PPP, one dollar can be used to buy the same quantity of goods elsewhere. Relative price of the goods between two countries will be none, or the real exchange rate is equal to one as arbitrage process will vanish price difference in either currency. 
price of the goods in US dollar will be the same in both countries. If it is measured in rupiah, the price will also be the same. Okay, let's see the illustration. To simplify the calculation, again, we are treating US as our domestic economy and Indonesia as foreign economy. Suppose we have uh, prices of Big Mac in US and in Indonesia like this. Then, with $10, we can buy two units of Big Mac in US by this calculation. How about in Indonesia? With purchasing power parity, the same amount of dollars can buy the same number of Big Mac in Indonesia. So if $10 is converted to rupiah, we will have rupiah as much as 10 times the nominal exchange rate, E. And the converted dollars will have exactly the same purchasing power in Indonesia. In other words, this equation will hold. From the equation, we get E, the nominal exchange rate, equals to foreign price per domestic price, which is 8,000 rupiah per dollar in our case. Accordingly, real exchange rate will be equal to 1, as E times P, the numerator, is 40,000 rupiah, while P star, the denominator, is also 40,000 rupiah, meaning that if Big Mac is sold in US dollar, one unit of Big Mac will cost $5 in both countries. If it is sold in rupiah, the cost in both countries will also be the same, 40,000 rupiah per unit. From the nominal exchange rate equation, it is clear that whenever either price changes, nominal exchange rate will also change. Domestic and foreign price in our example is using price of a specific commodity, Big Mac. In other situation, we may use CPI in United States and in Indonesia. The merit of using Big Mac is, of course, since the basket of goods is uh, identical, identical, make the comparisons or purchasing power of people in the two countries is more relevant. However, it may not be able to capture the whole picture like uh, if we rather use the CPI. So, is using the CPI the solution? Unfortunately, no. Using CPI is not perfect either and can even be worse because baskets of goods used in calculating CPI in US and in Indonesia are most likely different. We then cannot have an apple-to-apple -apple comparisons. Okay, what are the other limitations of uh, purchasing power parity uh, theory? From the textbook, we can observe two of them. First, arbitrage simply could not happen for certain commodities as they are not easily traded across borders. Second, even if they are tradable, the goods are not perfect substitute for their foreign counterparts. Thus, real exchange rate is not equal to one as the PPP suggests. It fluctuates. Then, can we just simply abandon the PPP theory? Of course not. PPP is a theory, so no, it won't be 100% accurate. It won't be 100% accurate, but the logic is relatively persuasive when explaining exchange rate in the long run condition. Real exchange rate in reality does fluctuate, but in favor of PPP theory, the fluctuation is small and temporary especially in the long run, while the large and persistent movements in nominal exchange rate, as suggested by the PPP theory, typically reflect changes in domestic and foreign price levels. Higher foreign inflation tends to lead to domestic currency appreciation, whereas higher domestic inflation tends to depreciate the currency. There are many models to determine the exchange rate. PPP is just one of them but it is considered the best in explaining the long-term trends in the exchange rate. Other models such as the flow approach to exchange rate determination or the stock model may be, or the stock model may be used to explain medium and the day-to-day -day determination of exchange rate. Unfortunately, the aforementioned models are beyond our discussion or coverage. For your information as well, Many analysts also use PPP to really compare the purchasing power between countries. 
The others also use PPP to evaluate whether current exchange rate of domestic currency is overvalued or undervalued. It is not the perfect measure, but it could give the indication to it so that policymakers, for instance, would not be too hurry in making certain policy or overreacting when there is change in nominal exchange rate that could be felt would hamper the trade balance or the domestic investment attractiveness. Okay, that's all from me. Thanks for the attention. Hope you get benefit from uh, from it. See you. Assalamualaikum.